Body Logic Physiotherapy, empowering people to achieve better health. Welcome to episode nine of the Empowered Beyond Pain podcast, proudly brought to you by Body Logic Physiotherapy. This is the final episode with Jennifer Pesord from Arthritis and Osteoporosis Western Australia as a guest host. And today, Jennifer and Dr. JP Kinero discuss when a consultation with a surgeon is appropriate, can care for osteoarthritis be done via online video consultations, and tips and advice as well as where to find more good quality resources. We hope you're enjoying this osteoarthritis mini-series. Please remember this conversation was a few weeks ago during the peak of the coronavirus pandemic in Perth, and circumstances have changed since then. Wherever you are in the world, we hope you're safe, looking after yourself and those around you, and remembering to ask, is there more to pain than damage? Thanks, JP. So what I heard came, coming through really strongly about um, uh, what consumers do, can do to manage this is, is um, weight management being of, of very high importance yep. and uh, not ceasing participation in enjoyable things, including exercise, to continue with those things and to adopt normal movement patterns and more protective yep. behaviours. Um, I'm just thinking about patients that have got really quite advanced changes of osteoarthritis on imaging, coupled with um, quite severe functional deficits and uh, high levels of pain that accompany that. Um, is everyone appropriate for non-conservative, sorry, for conservative management? Or are there some patients that really would be appropriate for review with an orthopaedic surgeon? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question uh, and a really important one to be addressed. Um, so what the guidelines tells us is that every patient that has NeoY should trial non uh, non surgical care before considering surgery, mm -hmm. and the level of um, activity and the level of education, the level of weight loss that they need to do will be individualized. Uh, we see many patients coming through the clinic that have uh, quite advanced uh, osteoarthritic changes uh, and functional limitation, but a lot of these patients have only been taking, being offered a very passive approach towards managing that condition. And what we know is that uh, joint replacements, knee replacements, uh, they can be really effective, right? They can be they can be life changing for many people. But we also know that about one in five patients may not have a significant change or be the same after surgery, and that is really tricky. The other thing that is quite a staggering statistic is that when we look at the number of patients that are offered and actually go through with a joint replacement, they have never been offered what is considered guideline recommended care and maybe a lot of these patients have been offered exercise and weight loss but they go into a consult and they are told that their knee is bone on bone and they should be careful with that joint and they will need a knee replacement so who in the you know clear mind would actually try and exercise on that knee they will try to preserve the joint and not exercise so there is this mismatch between how we convey the message and what we tell patients to do. So if I tell someone that they have bone on bone and immediately after I tell them to exercise, it creates a lot of confusion for the patient. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that every patient should be offered, even if they have advanced NeoY, they should be offered uh, uh, an opportunity to understand what that means to have a review and see if there, if there are factors in their life that can facilitate that process and try to regain some movement and learn some new habits uh, for their knee. Does that mean that everyone will then not go on and have surgery? No, that's not what I'm saying. But one of the things that we know is that surgery can be really useful for patients that have trialed and exhausted good non-surgical mm -hmm. care. Right, And that, what that means is that it's not only active, but it has the right dose. And the right dose is regular, graduated activation of your body, plus or minus weight loss, having a really good understanding of what the condition is. If you exhausted that and you've done that for enough time, 
uh, and you haven't achieved your goals, then surgery may be appropriate for you. Now, one of the things that we also know is that the predictors of outcome for surgery are, they are positive for patients that have more advanced OA changes, that have good mental health, and they don't have a weight problem. So those patients, they can do well. Now, the interesting thing is that the same study will show to us that patients that have the opposite, so they have low levels of changes in the in their radiology, in their imaging, they have uh, poor mental health, and they are obese or they have um, weight problems, that they don't tend to respond as well from surgery. So that group of patients, uh, offering them good education, weight loss, and a graduated exercise program may not divert them from having surgery, but may uh, provide them with a better outcome after surgery. So if we can, if I can summarize that, because there's a bit of information in it, is that surgery is an option and it can be a good option for many patients. Now, non-surgical approach is, if I dare to say, mandatory to every patient with uh, pain related to knee or way. Once they exhausted that good care with the uh, underpinning principles that we've been talking about here today, then surgery may be appropriate. But for those that have those particular obstacles of mental health and weight uh, and lower levels of changes in, in, their, uh, in their structure, uh, they may need combined care. They may, may need help with their mental health. They may need help with their, uh, with their weight. Uh, and they actually may need a longer program to then make a decision about having surgery or not. Thanks, JP. Um, I'm just thinking about the current situation that we have with the COVID-19 pandemic and that mm. as a consequence of that, all the low category uh, elective surgeries have been uh, postponed um, until we further understand how this will play out. For those mm. people that perhaps had knee surgery booked and that's now being cancelled, or for those people that were even contemplating surgery, um, even for those that want to continue managing conservatively, what kind of advice could you give them to help them in this uh, interim period while we travel through the COVID-19 problem? Yeah, that's a great question, Jennifer. Um, so one of the things that we know is that these are the times where you want to, you know, stay active, stay healthy, and keep your mental health in check. I think everyone is getting um, bombarded with information every day and there's a lot of uncertainty. And I can only imagine if I put myself in the shoes of a patient that felt that surgery was going to be the, you know, potentially a life-changing opportunity for them. And now that's been putting, put on hold, that could create a lot of distress. Uh, and as we described before, um, uh, stress can alter your, physiology and it, it's not good for you in terms of your general health. So if we look at these, uh, these circumstances, if you have a plan, that plan should be to stay active, even in the isolation of your home, or if you go outside, you may be walking, you may be riding your bike, um, you may, you know, whatever um, uh, opportunity you have. Uh, and it is a time where you can, go back to some of the advice you've been given and, and try to apply that even in the safety of your home. Now, if you don't have a plan and or you don't have an active plan, uh, and what I mean by that is maybe the way that you manage your condition up until this point is that you just, you may go to the physio and the physio may do some movements with your leg and may do a bit of massage, a bit of needling. So it's a really passive approach that you're not going to have that any longer at this stage. So what you need to do is to seek guidance to get an active management plan. So at this point in time, there are some clinics that are still open. Uh, we uh, have made a decision before, um, uh, it, this happened last week actually, we made a decision of uh, shutting down the clinic for any face-to-face -face contact. But we do have the option, not just us, but uh, physiotherapy is now having the option of telehealth. Uh, and that is a great way of, for patients that don't have a plan or want to review their plan to actually have a consult with a clinician 
to develop an active man management plan and to get some guidance during this tough period. And many people um, may not be aware of this, but there have been studies, uh, particularly in the knee, that demonstrate that an examination uh, of the knee and the outcomes of knee management via telehealth is just as effective as face-to-face -face contact. And if we think back at the beginning of our conversation, where we're talking about what are the things that patients with knee away need, what are the things they need to target, what are the things they need to go for, it's a really active plan, and it's a plan that can be delivered online. So it's not, not everyone that will need hands-on treatment. So if you're sitting at home and you don't have a plan, my suggestion would be to get some guidance uh, and develop uh, a plan with someone that you can self-manage manage during, uh, during this process. So JP, how can people access those services? Is there a requirement to um, either yeah. phone in or go into the GP to get a referral through the chronic conditions management plan to then access telehealth services with the physiotherapist? Yeah, yeah. So um, we've been in contact with uh, clinicians across Australia uh, and uh, quite a few clinics are offering uh, um, a reduction in, in, in their prices to offer this service while the, uh, the health system is not 100% uh, you know, supporting this service. But we had a really rapid response from private health funds as well as Medicare and uh, WorkCover and ICWA where they actually are supporting telehealth appointments. So that's a great step towards supporting the community, community in a really tough time. Uh, it, from what we understand, if you want to see a private physiotherapist for a telehealth consult, you need to call your GP and get uh, a referral. And many clinicians in particular, and some patients are seeing this as a, uh, a deterrent of, uh, of the service and, and seeing it as an obstacle. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's a way of creating actually a relationship where the patient sees a GP, the GP sends the patient to the physio, the physio will do a consult, will communicate back to the GP or the rheumatologist. And so you create a team around that person. So that person is not isolated, seeing you know, just clinicians in the, in the community with no contact with the GP. So I actually think it's a, a, it can be seen as a really positive step. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Um, of course, if you go into private practice, you can then you know, pay for the consult yourself. But a lot of people are, are in a really tough situation uh, at the moment, um, and but there are opportunities where you can uh, communicate with someone. And also at times, uh, if we think of there, there are some conditions which uh, you you may need to see a, a, a physio face to face. But when we look in particularly for chronic conditions such as knee osteoarthritis or hip osteoarthritis or back pain, um, the way we we see the care being delivered to patients with those conditions. Uh, you know, uh, lends itself so well for telehealth. Uh, we've been doing this, this for uh, for the week now, and we ask our patients about you know how do they see this uh, this this change in pace where we get patients you know across the screen as opposed to sitting uh, in front of us. Uh, and although it seems a bit strange, they a lot of the patients feel like they actually get what they need out of, out of this. And patients with knee OA, they need to understand how to move and they need to change their habits. They need to get good reassurance and, um, and healthy lifestyle advice. Uh, so it can be really useful for that. Thanks, JP. We're drawing to the end of our um, Q&A time now. And I'm just thinking about some final uh, tips um, and advice that you could leave our consumers and uh, our health professionals with. Are there any national guidelines that would be really helpful to guide health professionals and consumers um, around the good quality investigation management of OA knee? Yeah, so I think um, you know there are some uh, there are several national models of care for uh, the management of, of knee OA. The Victorian model of care, which was revised in recent years, has a, a, a really strong plan. But across the states, the, the narrative of, about how you should manage uh, knee OA has an underpinning active approach towards it. Um, so 
quite accessible for consumers are um, credible websites such as uh, Pain Health, um, where you can find uh, really detailed information about uh, osteoarthritis. You can find patient stories, um, and there are a few um, exercising strategies that are provided in websites like that. Uh, that's a WA-based um, uh, or funded uh, founded website. Uh, but also myjointpain.org.au is another website that is quite, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, developed by really credible people uh, and high-level researchers and clinicians in the space of uh, osteoarthritis. And, and of course, the Arthritis Foundation in, in WA provides several, you know, readily available resources, uh, and they are there for, to answer questions, and uh, they have a really good place in the community to provide support to people with uh, with NeoI. And, and probably a message that I think it's really important to, um, it may not have come transparent through this, is um, that having pain when you're trying to use a joint uh, that is sore, so a, a, a joint with knee osteoarthritis, if you're using that leg and it's sore, and you're trying to exercise and you're getting some pain, that that pain does not mean you're causing, in many cases, it does not mean you're causing any harm to the joint. It just means that it's getting adapted to a new um, load in the, in the knee joint. So they've done studies with people that were in a wait list for getting a, a knee replacement, and they offered them, do you want to go and you know, take a chance of doing some exercises for six weeks? Um, and and these people went through that process. And uh, a large proportion of those patients, in the first week or two, or even three, they had an increase in their mm -hmm. discomfort in their knee. And these were exercises that were tailored to, uh, to their uh, starting point. Um, and, but over time, as those exercises were slowly graduated and adapted to that particular person, the, a large proportion of the group actually noticed a reduction in pain. So it's really important to understand that as you start doing some exercise in a joint that is stiff, it's the muscles are weak and it's deconditioned and you're a bit frightened to use the, the joint, it is normal to have a slight increase in discomfort. And But that should not be a barrier for you to continue. That should be a, a, a point where you go, right, I need to continue developing gradually this program and use my leg, becoming more confident, becoming a bit stronger. And what we tend to see is that you increase the amount of things that you do and your function, uh, and you can get also a reduction in pain. And of course, this varies in, in an individual basis, uh, but there are some evidence to demonstrate that. And these management approaches, they can be delivered one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and here we're talking online at this stage, but fingers crossed soon we'll be face-to-face -face again. Uh, they can be delivered one-on-one, -on -one, but they can also be delivered in a group. Uh, and there are some great initiatives across Australia and at uh, the Arthritis Foundation uh, in WA where you can get access to, uh, to, those, uh, to those programs. Yeah, we'll be providing those programs online. Hopefully, we'll go live with that um, next week as well. Fantastic. Um, so I'd really like you to, to thank you, JP. You, you are um, very generous of your time and sharing your expertise. I appreciate this is a very busy time for you at the moment. So thank you for uh, being able to provide our consumers and our health professionals with some very sound and credible advice about how to manage knee osteoarthritis and the pain and dysfunction that's associated with it. Uh, we really appreciate you giving your time. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Jennifer. So there you have it. As always, the resources discussed, including links to the West Australian Government Department of Health website, Pain Health, myjointpain.org.au, and of course the Arthritis and Osteoporosis Western Australia website can be found on the show notes page for episode 9, which can be found at www.bodylogic.physio forward slash podcast. For our To Try Today segment... Perhaps you can reflect on what areas of your lifestyle you could improve. Then find someone to share that with and keep you accountable. Things are usually easier as a team. One of my favourite studies published in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology looks at how steep you estimate the slant of a hill 
and if you're with a close friend, you estimate the slant of the hill to be less steep than if you're alone. Shows how psychosocial support can make things seem easier and all the more reason to find a buddy to share your goals with. At the very least, you can take a screenshot of this episode, post it to your social media and tag us in it so we can keep you accountable. Our handle is at EBP Podcast on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. That's it for this week. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Empowered Beyond Pain and we've suitably made sense of science and brought evidence into your eardrums. Until next week... Remember to ask, is there more to pain than damage? Please note, what you heard on this episode of Empowered Beyond Pain is strictly for information purposes only and does not substitute individualised care from a trusted and licensed health professional. If you would like individualised high value care for your pain, sports or pelvic health problem, head to the BodyLogic website and make an appointment. Theme music generously provided by Fervin and Cash.